Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the webinar. Hope you are well. Hope you've had a good day. Hopefully, you're ready for an hour of value in terms of getting you ready for your GP training. Thank you so much to everybody who said hello already. We have around 100 on. We've got around 450 signups. So I'm going to give people a bit of time to come on board. Hi, Sadia. How are you doing? Hopefully, you can hear me. Just give me a yes, guys, if you can hear me. Just so I know you, I am here. Yes, yes, fantastic. Lots of yeses coming through. Hi, Anne Harasaidia. Hi, Mateus. Hi, GK. Hey, Pratigya, Fanyu. Good to see some names that I've been seeing over the last few weeks and months in our webinars. Hi, Talib. Hi, GK. How are you doing? Hi, Ahmed. Good to see you. Hope you are all well. I'm just going to give a few minutes just to get on board. There are currently around 30 people on the website trying to sign up right now. So I'm just going to give them a few minutes to get on board but welcome how was your day let me know how you've been we've got a good spread of people on actually some people who are starting in two weeks some people who are planning to prepare for gp entry um and we've got some current gpst ones on board as well hi faria how are you doing hi Oli Semni, good to see you how many of you guys have been on our webinars before how many of you been on our lockdown webinars just give me a yes if you have hi reem Oh, a lot of you, a lot of you have been back again. You've been following us throughout the summer. You've been fed of my voice, I guess, by now. But I think we're on our 15th or 16th webinar since March. So I think we've covered quite a lot of ground. So it's good to see some people who are back again. And lots of you saying you're on all of them. Great. So some people letting you know where you are. Right. So if I change the screen, can you, can you see the screen change? Just give me a yes. Let's get all this stuff out the way so you're ready. Good, lots of yeses. Okay, so we are still some people on the website. So I'm going to give them another 30 seconds and then we're going to start. We're going to keep this interactive. We tried to keep the chat off screen so I can see all of your comments and questions and I'll go through the answers as we go. We have our chat on screen before, but it does get a little bit in the way and kind of disrupts the flow of the webinar. So I'll be answering all the questions. If I don't get to answer them there and then, if it's a quick question, I'll answer it there and then. If it's a longer one, I'll go back at the end and follow through later on. Hi, Mahip, how are you doing? Hi, Alaba. Good to see once again some new names and some people that I'm familiar with from social media. Welcome to everybody. Let me know how your day was. Were you working? Were you off? What were you doing today? Uh, Peds day, medicine on call, stroke, um, annual leave, fantastic, well done. Very tiring day. We're gonna wake you up, that's why you're here. Also, Geriatrics, GP land, very good. So I guess that's an F2 in GP. Studying for DRCOG, well done. You're getting ahead already, Reem, excellent. Standard day, Nasir. Hey, Nasir, how are you doing? Psychiatry, medicine on call. Can I take screenshots? You can indeed, I'm gonna take as many shots as you like. You'll be able to watch this back um, on YouTube and on our website tomorrow if you miss any. But please do take any photos that you like. Finish at 7.30, well done for getting on board. Supposed to finish early. Yes, that is um, unfortunately the way that it is sometimes, but welcome. Okay, so I think we're strong in terms of numbers. It's 35, so I think we will go. What have we got on tonight then? So I want you to just give me a number. Put number one if you're starting GP training in two weeks. Number two if you're aiming for a Feb 21 start. Three if it's August 21. Four if you're thinking of 2022. Five if you're already a GP trainee, and six if you're a GP educator. Let's see who we've got. So lots and lots and lots and lots of ones. Wow, well done. So you're already thinking ahead. When I was two weeks away from my GP training, I was not joining any webinars. I wasn't thinking about it. It kind of hit me. So well done for planning ahead. A few of you think in February 21, great. So we've got some things for you coming up in the webinar itself, and quite a few fives as well. So it's great to see some GP ST ones already on board, and, and some that I recognize actually. Hi, Kwaja, how are you doing? You weren't ever present on our webinars, which is great. Let me know if this is the first ever Aurora webinar that you're doing. Just give me a why if it's your first ever Aurora webinar, and let me know how you heard about us if it's the first time you're hearing about us. And lots of yeses are welcome, welcome, welcome. Hey, Pani, hi, Hitham, hey, Ifi. Hi, Malia, hi, Thay. First, lots of you on for the first time. Fantastic. Welcome. Hopefully, this is not the last time you'll be on one of our webinars. We do regular teaching webinars in the evenings, but loads and loads and loads of you are brand new to us. And how did you hear about us? Let us know. So social media people are saying generally through your Facebook page, fantastic, lots of social media stuff. Good to connect with you guys. Friends, friends, WhatsApp, Telegram. Great, 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 great. However you heard of you, welcome. So as you can see, lots of people joining in two weeks and starting in two weeks. So I hope you're looking forward to it. What are the aims of tonight's webinar then? So 10 things I wish I knew before I started GP training. I started GP training a while ago now. I've been a GP for about 10 years. 
And I remember the couple of weeks to months before my GP training, I didn't really think about it. I didn't really plan it. It was kind of a mix of anxiety, nerves, excitement, thinking, yes, it's the start of my new career. I've worked really hard to get this. But then a lot of things kind of hit me that I wasn't expecting. So we're going to talk about 10 things that I wish I knew or at least had thought a little bit about before I started GP training. I think it would have got me off to a better start than I did and probably would have made more of my three years because three years goes very fast. And even if it changes to five years, it's still going to go very, very fast. And before you know, it's going to be finished. What are the kind of things you think about now? So two weeks ago or maybe you know three, four months ago, depending on when you're starting. But what are the kind of things you think about now? How to maximize choice? Sometimes we always think that we kind of put on this a roller coaster, and we have to go from step to step to step. But actually, there's a lot of choices in GP training. We'll talk about how to make your choices work for you so you can start to create your own career. A lot of people think, oh, I'll start choosing things when I become a GP, but you can start to create things early on. We'll talk a bit about those and how, of course, you can look after yourself throughout training because there are some difficult days, there are some challenging things that are going to be coming ahead, and it's important to plan for them, think about them, and have an idea about where do I go when these kind of things happen. Okay, so and a couple of special offers. We always, always, always give webinar only special offers for people who attend the webinar itself. So around about halfway, we'll be giving code for three things, 20% off our brand new GP20 Max online course. So this is a full half day online course for people starting GP20. It covers everything you need to know before GP training, the assessments, the exams. I'll talk a bit about what that is a little bit later. And that was only released yesterday. So it's brand new. 15% off our GPSD1 50 key presentations audiobook course. So what are the kind of things you're going to think about seeing in GP land and how can you start thinking about these in your hospital rotations? And then 10% off our revision flashcards. And I'll give you some examples about what they are. They've been released for about a month and a half now and people find them very useful for things like AKT. So we're going to give you codes for all of these. There are 10 codes to use for each of these three. So um, be ready for when they are given in the audio code. So a bit about my background for those of you who don't know me or have not heard of me. I'm a portfolio GP. I'm now in full-time medical education, at least for now. And I may be going back in a little bit later on. But for now, it's all about medical education. And my aim is to try and help people through, yes, exams, but also maximize GP training. So what are the kind of roles that I've done? Lots of things to do with GP training, I guess. I used to be a, a VTS program director. We'll talk about what their role is a little bit later on. I'm a fellow of the Royal College of GPs, which is a great honor for me to get this um, within, I think, six years of being a GP, which is very surprising for me. I was an appraiser of previous GPs. I've been an examiner for PLAB2. And I've had a lot of roles within health education West Midlands. So if you're a West, West Midlands trainee, then a lot of your PDs, and I'll probably know them. I've been on the IMG faculty board. I've been running courses and training people, mainly for MRCGP for the last 10 years. But now we do other things as well. And I'm also a meditation trainer. And I'd use that in my other roles as well. So what do we help people for? MRCGP, AKT, CSA are our bulk but now GP entry, MSRA, PLAB, medical school. And also we started to help train pharmacists and advanced nurse practitioners um, and the future of primary care. And remember, you're going into a, a field that's going to be very different in three years time. What it's like now is going to be very different for when you come out. So there's going to be a lot more people involved in the work that you're doing. And we're trying to help those along the way as well. So very quickly then, for those of you who are starting in two weeks time, in one word, how are you feeling about being a new GP trainee? Just give me one word. Anxious. We've got nervous. We've got excited. What else have you got? Give me some words. Scared. A lot of anxious coming. Overwhelmed. I can imagine. I can imagine, Reem. It's very overwhelming when you're starting something as big as GP training. Nervous, excited. Never worked in a GP surgery. That's okay. That's, that's the majority of people probably on this webinar haven't done that. Tempted. Great, great word. Lots of excited. Um, yeah, lots of excited, a lot of nervous. So the three biggest words coming out here are nervous, excited, and uh, anxious. There's a few confused coming in, worried, nervous. Good. So this is good. Like having nerves means it, it means something to you. You're bothered enough about being a good GP trainee for it to matter. So it's really good that you're thinking like this. Excitement, of course, you're at the start of your career. This is a this is going to be, in reality, a very small blip in your career. Three years is going to fly by. In 10 years, you'll, you'll think three years was, was a tiny blip. But at the moment, it seems like a huge mountain ahead of you. We're going to break down some of these things. Apprehensive, happy, good, excellence, and positivity coming through as well. Looking forward to it. Good. Okay, very quickly then. What worries or concerns you most about starting GP training right now? What things stress you out, worry you? make you feel a little bit anxious, a bit nervous. What, are we to, what have we got in front of us? Let's see if I can calm some of these nerves down. So not knowing enough. Okay, don't worry about that. We'll talk about this later on. On calls, e-portfolio, performance, the exams, work-life balance, new hospitals, not knowing enough, e-portfolio, brand new to the NHS. Welcome, firstly, new place. 
not knowing enough, the rotor, getting enough experience, medicine on calls. Yeah, I used to really worry about medicine on calls and a &E. um, e-portfolio, rotor, too much information, rotor, 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 new, new to NHS. Okay, so lots and lots and lots of familiar things. And I was feeling exactly like this beforehand. I think it was only about three days before I started GP training that it all hit me. I was in my old world, to be honest. Um, finishing off F2 when I was started, but then these exact things hit me as well. Not so much the new to NHS bit, but just the information, the the rotor, the e-portfolio. And I I feel that I feel you and I, and I get this. And this webinar hopefully is going to mean in the next kind of 50 minutes or so, you'll walk away with a lot of those concerns taken away so you can focus more on the excitement um, and looking forward to your first two weeks. So the first thing, I haven't even congratulated you. Well done, firstly, for getting to GP training. It is not an easy thing to do. It takes a lot of hard work. It takes a lot of sacrifice. It takes a lot of energy. You've got to do your assessments. I know things have been a little bit different at the moment with the whole COVID situation and MSRA being a bit different, but even you guys having just got through SJTs is really impressive because I, you know, a lot of people struggle with those. So congratulations on getting to this point. You're at a really, really important juncture in your career now because a lot of decisions that you make in the next three years are going to determine what you end up doing for the next 40 or 50 years if, if you work for that long. So this time is really important. But take a bit of time just to, to self-congratulate yourself because it's not a little achievement. Um, and I often look back at it now and, and, and don't think of it enough as a big achievement, but it is. It's a huge step in your career. So congratulations. And for those who are going to be in this position in six months time or 12 months time, you'll know just how much hard work you put into getting to that stage. In a few years, in three, maybe four, depending on circumstances, you will be making lots and lots of choices about your career. OK, for the next three or four years, you're kind of put into positions where you can't make that many choices. But in a few years, you're going to be making so many choices and you're going to be creating your own working style. Are you going to be a partner, essentially a business owner? Are you going to be running a practice where you can make decisions and influence change? Are you going to be a salary GP? Are you going to be locum, your own individual business, putting yourself out and being paid for the work that you do? Are you going to be someone who's just a digital GP? We may have GPs who don't see patients at all. They just work online through telephone, particularly now what's happening in the COVID team, general practice is changing very quickly. Do you want to be an out of hours GP, someone who just works weekends, someone who just works nights? This is getting very popular now. So you may be that choice that you're taking. And are you going to be a portfolio GP? Very, very common buzz term at the moment. What does it mean? It just means a GP does lots of different things. And to be honest, most GPs who come out now are some kind of portfolio GP. But you've got to choose what you're doing in a few years. Are you going to work part time? Are you going to work full time? Does full time mean full time clinical? or full-time or full clinical plus something else? Are you going to simply do block work, just Mondays and Tuesdays, and that's it? That's my week. It's up to you. The next three or four years, are you working to get to the position where you make these decisions? There's lots of exciting schemes and things coming out now to keep people in general practice, so you could be taking advantage of these in a few years. And there are so many additional things that people do now that you will be able to do and sometimes start creating these things in the middle of your GP training, medical education, medical legal work, insurance work, medical politics. My wife is medical politics gained. I'm medical education gained. But you can do whatever you like. Research, doctorpreneur, start a business. There's lots of GPs these days starting their own business, being a gypsy, a GP with a special interest in something else. It could be you know, musculoskeletal, it could be diabetes, it could be nothing to do with clinical stuff. Aesthetics GPs, travel GPs, the GPs who work abroad, occupational health GPs, and a lot of people going to the private sector as well. Now, these are all choices that you are going to be working hard to make in the next three or four years. So whenever you have tough days in general practice training, whenever you think that, oh gosh, this is difficult, and did I make the right choice, and I don't like the rotation I'm doing, just think of it in the bigger picture. You'll be making these kind of choices. This is why you're working so hard when it gets tough. And we'll come back to tough days in a second. Right. The first thing that I didn't really think about before general practice training, I remember, I didn't really realize how lost I would feel in the first few weeks. Now, I thought I knew the NHS. I'd worked in the NHS. I'd done, I, I finished medical school. I did F1. I did F2. And then I started GP training. So I'd kind of worked in the NHS. And I'd even done a GP job in F2. I did a four-month GP rotation. But I still remember in those first few weeks of general practice training, I felt so, so lost. So when you're in this position in about three to four weeks time and you're kind of feeling, gosh, I don't know where I'm coming or going. I've got so much information coming to me. I've got so many inductions to do. I've got so much stuff to learn and to remember. Don't worry. It happens to everybody. And I forget how shook up I was in that first few weeks. So it's going to happen. 
So I thought it's worth just getting a few bearings right now, just some of the basics out the way at the beginning of the webinar. So these kind of things are in your mind. So of course, it's minimum three years specialty training as a GPS, a GP specialist trainee. Usually at least 18 months is in an approved training practice split between two practices usually, but it can be slightly more as well. And the remaining months are in some other non-GP rotation, A and E, general medicine, elderly care, et cetera, et cetera. The, these are the basic ones that most people end up doing in GP training. I did, apart from my ST2 four months in GP and my ST3 in GP, I did four months in A and E. I did four months in general medicine, stroke, elderly care. I did four months in, what else did I do? Pediatrics. And I did four months in obstetrics and gynecology. So I had a really good range, but people are already asking me what's the right rotations to do? What should I do for GP land? And to be honest, I'll be, I'll be honest with you right now, it doesn't really matter what rotations you get in ST1 and ST2. The bulk of learning from a primary care point of view happens in your GP rotation. So please don't worry if you're really was hoping to get pediatrics or really hoping to get psychiatry and you haven't got it, please don't worry too much. In the big scheme of things, that four months is not going to change your career. And there are some innovative posts available now where some people, you may be doing this, have a split week. So you're doing some days in hospital and some days in GP land, but that's not happening um, across the whole of the UK. So at the end of your training, you receive a CCT, Certificate of Completion of Training, and you can't work in the, Jeep in the as a GP in the UK unless you have a CCT. This puts you on the register under the GMC to work as a GP. But to complete your training, to get your CCT, you need to achieve MRCGP. And there are three components to MRCGP, WBPA, Work-Based Place Assessment. We'll talk about this a little bit later on, the AKT exam, and the CSA exam. At the moment, you might have heard of the RCA. That's the current replacement for the CSA because of COVID. But CSA, by the time you come around to doing it, it'll be the CSA exam again. So it's these three components, and there are a third each. So you get people who pass both exams, but they don't pass their work-based place assessments, and they don't end up being a GP. So it's really important to remember that all three are really, really important. And this will be something that's drilled into you throughout training, I'm sure. So at the end of each year, you need to clear your AICP, your annual review of competency progress. And basically all the evidence that you've built up in the year is looked at at the end of the year to see can you progress to the next step. And we'll talk about AICP a little bit later on in the webinar. So if you're on a standard current three-year pathway, if you're full-time, then you're right here, GPST1. You'll have a, what we call an ESR every six months of your training. We'll talk about what an ESR is in a second. And you have an ARCP at the end of every year and then a final one at the end to see can you now be a GP. And your exam windows start at ST2. So you can take AKT from GPST2 onwards and you can take CSA from GPST3 onwards. We'll talk about these exams in a bit more detail later on. So that's some basics about GP training. One of the first things I would do when you start to feel lost and a little bit worried is in those first two weeks, ask questions. Remember you're in training, so you're not the finished article. So you can be asking questions just from that point of view, but you're in training at the beginning of a three year rotation scheme. So ask questions. No one is going to think these questions are silly. No one is going to come across a question that people haven't asked before whether it's in hospital, whether it's to your PDs, whether it's to your supervisors, ask questions because the earlier you ask the questions, the more confidence you get and actually the easier it is to ask the question. You know when you have a question that you think you need to ask on day one and you don't ask it on day one and before you know it, it's the fourth week and now you feel like you can't ask the question because it's too long and everybody knows and I don't know and it's going to be silly. Just ask in the foot. When it comes to your mind, it comes to your mind for a reason, ask the question. You're not expected to know everything. This is from a clinical point of view, obviously, you're trained to be a GP, but just from a logistical point of view, like you, you're in a brand new place. It's just like going back to doing your first, you know, standalone SHO job. You're not expected to know everything. Ask questions. Otherwise, it gets harder and harder and harder to ask those questions as you go along. And remember, there is no question, no question in the world that you can ask that someone hasn't heard before. I get questions from GP trainees every single day. And everyone thinks that their first time, I hope it's not a silly question. It's never a silly question because these questions are questions that I had when I was a GP trainee and everybody else has been through the system has had as well. So please, 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 please don't be afraid to ask in those first few weeks. Number two, I remember very clearly about three or four weeks into GP training, I couldn't work out who was who. There was all these acronyms going around, ESCS, AD, and I was just lost and I hadn't done what I just told you to do. I didn't ask questions early on. I was getting emails from people and I couldn't work out 
who's this person compared to this person? And I'd been through inductions and I'd had all the inductions that you're going to get. But inductions, how, how, how often do you stay awake in inductions? It's just information given to you left, right, and center. Or you get a whole barrage of emails that you're not going to look at anyway. So I remember not knowing who is who. So let's try and get these basic things right. Right, your ES, your ES, educational supervisor, is one of the most important people in the next three to four years of training. It's the person who essentially overviews your whole training. It's the GP who is going to be with you in your final year. So your ES is going to be the person who you do your final ST3 year of general practice with. And they basically monitor your progress from start to finish. And they're the ones who are going to do your six monthly reviews, call your ESR, which we'll come on to later, Educational Supervisor Report. So your ES is a super important person. And it's someone that you really want to try and get a, get a, get ahead with early on. And we'll talk about how to do that a little bit later on in the webinar. So you assign them to monitor your progress throughout the whole training, and it's usually your supervisor in your ST3 year. Your CS or your clinical supervisor is the person that oversees you in your individual rotations. So say you're doing pediatrics, you'll have a pediatric consultant who is your clinical supervisor for that role. If you're doing um, obstetric and gynecology, you have an ONG consultant who is your clinical supervisor. So you have several different clinical supervisors throughout GP training, but you only have one educational supervisor. Now, a clinical supervisor can be a GP or a consultant. If you're doing ST2 jobs or ST1 jobs in general practice, then it's a different GP in that practice who is your clinical supervisor. But you still have your educational supervisor who oversees your whole training. So CS versus ES. Then you have TPDs or PDs, training program directors or program directors. This is I was a TPD on three different schemes. I was a TPD first on Stafford and Stokes, um, Stafford, Midstaff, no which was Stafford and Canuck scheme. So if you're starting in Stafford and Canuck, I know the TPDs very well. I was also a PD in the East Birmingham scheme as well until about three years ago. So if you're starting East Birmingham, it's a great VTS, you'll enjoy it a lot. And I've also locum PD in North Birmingham VTS and I've met quite a few VTS schemes across the country. So PDs generally are people who are managing or overseeing your VTS scheme. So for example, um, East Birmingham VTS or Coven Warwick VTS or um, you know, some of the London ones, there's loads of them, but that's so your TP, you probably have three to four TPDs, depending on how big your VTS is. Remember, you have VTSs in the UK where there may be only six trainees and there are VTSs like Cov and Warwick where they have like 100 and 200 and just feed trainees everywhere. So there's a huge range in terms of the size of your VTS. And that will relate to how many PDs you have or program directors. What does a PD do? They're basically problem solved. They liaise with the secondary care. They, they look at things like rotors. They're the person that you go to if you have any queries. And they manage a particular scheme. And they manage the teaching program. And we'll talk about the teaching program later on. AD, area director. They supervise a whole patch within a deanery. So, for example, East Birmingham BTS is part of the Birmingham and Solihull patch. So your area director ma manages the whole of the Birmingham and Solihull patch. So you'll find that you have an individual VTS scheme and then you have a bigger scheme where an area director will cover. Then you have a head of school and they cover all the patches in that area. So for example, Birmingham and Solihull is one of the five areas in the West Midlands Deanery. So H-E-W-M, Health Education West Midlands, you have a head of school. But this person, you really just wanna know the name. You don't wanna ever meet this person um, there are certain reasons why you will. They'll come to your induction. They may do talks for you, but you don't really want to get to know them that well. But the people you're going to go, get to know very well are your TPDs, your ES, and then your, hopefully your CS in your uh, rotations. But it depends on one rotation to another. So hopefully that's kind of summarized um, the people involved. Does that all make sense? Do, do you understand who these people are? What's a VTS vocational training scheme? So that's the kind of little patch that you're going to be based in where you go and have your half day teaching once a week. That's a VTS. TPD is training program director. In some areas, they're called program directors. So it's either PDs or TPDs. AD is area director. Area director. So they, they're, 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 they, they manage several VTS schemes under their patch. And head of school looks at several patches, which may include 10, 15, 20 different individual VTS schemes. Good. Now, with all of these people, one thing that's really, really, really important is make the first moves. So there's nothing better than showing initiative, sending an email. The moment you know your ES, send them an email. Hi, I'm Dr. Aman. Um, just want to introduce myself. I'm your new ST1. I'll be with you for the next three years. Just simple email. But if you don't do it, they're going to do it. But it looks so much better if it comes from you. When you find out your clinical supervisor, send them an email. Hi, I'm Dr. Aman. 
Um, just to let you know, I'll be with you for the next four months doing pediatric rotation as part of GP training. Full stop. Simple email. But what does it do? It shows initiative. It shows that you can plan things well, that you're not all over the place, that you've got a bit of planning in you. You can think about, you looked ahead, you've kind of planned out your next few months and it shows organization. There's nothing better than setting a good first impression because at the end of the day, these people write assessments, they write reports on you and first impressions like anything else count. So show the initiative, make the first moves, email educational supervisors. If you've got the name already, send them an email tomorrow. Email clinical supervisors. If you, if you know, you may not know your clinical supervisor yet, but the moment you find out on day one of your rotation, send them a quick email. Your program directors, you might have got an email from them already to welcome you to the scheme. The moment you get that, send them an email back. Hi, thank you so much. Look forward to meeting you soon. Just something simple, but make the first move. Don't let somebody make the first move to you and chase you. Practice management is really important. When you get your um, ST3 rotation, so you know which practice you're going to be with in ST3, and you'll know that because you'll know your educational supervisor, send the practice manager of that practice an email. Hi, I'm Dr. So-and-so. I'll be coming to your practice in two years' time for my ST3 year. It's really important to get to know the practice manager, and I'll talk about why, because when they're the ones who are gonna help you in all the nitty gritty that you need to know about that your trainer won't be able to help you with. So getting a first impression off, making sure that they're aware of you, even two years in advance is a very useful thing. They'll remember, trust me, they'll remember when you come back in two years time. I remember you sent me that email and it was great to, to hear from you. These little things make a difference. So please, please, please make the first moves with all of these strange kind of acronym people that you're gonna come across in the first few weeks. Number three, very, very, very important. I was guilty of this in my own rotations. I forgot that I was a GP trainee. I forgot that I, I, was, I, was, I was doing my job, I was getting over my job, and I kept forgetting that I'm actually a GP trainee. I am training to become a GP. So there are certain things that I need to do, certain ways I need to think that are going to allow me to get the most out of this job. Otherwise, what happens? You just do four months, and you don't really get anything out of it. You're just kind of service provision. And you come out thinking, well, how was that beneficial to me as a GP trainee? Don't forget that you're a GP trainee in your hospital rotations. I was going through, my, my first rotation was A&E. And I got in, you know what a and &E is like, it's just crazy anyway. So I just got in there and I was, it took me about two months just to get used to it all. And I completely forgot that I was a GP trainee. So I just didn't really get anything out of those first two months of rotation. So when you're in a hospital job, think like a GP. If you've got a few minutes and you're clocking someone, think like a GP. What would I do if I saw this patient on a Friday evening on my own with no equipment here, with no ability to do blood tests, with no ability to do a scan? How would I think? What questions would I need to know? What would I need to know about their life? What would I need to know about what's going on in their mind? Think like a GP. Of course, sometimes when it's on call, it's crazy and you don't have time to do this kind of stuff, but it's not always like that. If you're sitting in clinic, for example, and you're seeing somebody with menorrhagia who comes in, if you're doing ONG, think like a GP. If I saw this lady in my GP clinic, then what are the kind of things that I need to be thinking about? Just if you do that once a day with one patient every day in a hospital rotation, you're going to have thought about being a GP hundreds of times in that rotation by the end, and you're going to be a step ahead already for when you get into GP land. So make sure once in a while you sit back and think that I am a GP trainee because I didn't do that for most of my training, at least with the start of my jobs, and I knew I could have got more out of it if I did. So what are the kind of things you can do in your hospital rotations? Make sure, for example, if you're going to theater a lot, get used to things that you may be talking about in GP land. So make sure you understand about consent. Make sure you know about counseling, pre-op pre counseling, counseling after operations. Because remember, people are going to come and see you before an operation, and then come and see you after an operation. So knowing a bit about what is talked about, what are the common things that might happen is very useful. And you can only really get that when you're in a hospital environment. Clinics, yes, go to clinics because you're rotated into them, but make sure you go into clinics that you think are important. GPSI clinics, for example, if you know you want to do be a GPSI in women's health and you're doing obstetrics and gynecology, yes, go to the ONG clinics, but try and go to the clinics where GPs are leading them in ONG. Again, it just gives you a different slant on things gives you a different perspective of how a GP would approach these kind of things. MDT is very important. Understand how the system works, but think of it from a GP point of view. Yes, do the MDT work that you need to do in the hospital rotation that you're doing, but think about how is MDT going to follow up outside? Ask a few questions of people like OTs and physios. How do you do it in somebody's house? Yes, it's one thing to do it in a hospital ward, but what about outside? Just get used to these kind of things. Audits, yes, you may have to do them, but if you can choose them, do them in a GP-centric way. And when you're writing these like discharge summaries and letters to GPs, think about when you're writing a letter to a GP, what is it that that GP is going to find useful? What would I find useful if I'm sitting and reading this letter in GP land? When I'm writing a TTO or discharge summary, what are the kind of things that me sitting in a clinic in six months time is going to want to know about that patient? That's often not 
a 15 page write up of every single detail, it's probably four or five key things that a GP is needing to know. So think like a GP when you're in a hospital rotation and you'll find them much more valuable. What are the kind of things to do before each rotation? You can do some of this stuff now if you know where you're going in the next few weeks. Contact your CS like we talked about. Speak to someone who's done the rotation already. If you know people who are in the scheme, if you've got people who've been through not just that rotation in that hospital, but that rotation in GP training, just ask them, what did you do in pediatrics? What did you do in A&E? What's useful for me to think about? People have been this through this before you. You don't need to work everything out yourself. Speak to someone who's done the rotation already. Think about the assessments. We'll talk about assessments in a second. Which ones are the mandatory ones? You need to get ahead so you can start them early so you're not stressing near the end. Think about which ones might be good to do. SEPs are all about examinations. We'll talk about those later on. But try and figure out, okay, I've got to do certain examinations. Which are the ones that I can do in this rotation best? Which are the ones that are going to help me um, achieve those quickest? So thinking about these things before each rotation is very important. What's important about PDP? We'll talk about PDPs later on. How do you tailor it? And think about it before you start so you're already ahead when you start. Plan which clinics you want to go to. If you're doing respiratory medicine, think already, I want to go to a couple of asthma clinics. I want to go to some pediatric asthma clinics. I want to go to a COPD clinic. If you haven't thought about this, then it'll take you two months to think about it. And then before you know it, everybody's already booked those clinics and you're going to struggle to get into them. Think about what you're weak in that area. Very important. You may love I don't know, you may love pediatrics, but not like a particular part, or you may love rheumatology, but not like a particular part. Make sure you focus on how you're gonna plug your weak gaps, because everyone runs to the clinics they want to go to, but what about the clinics that you don't wanna to go to, or you're a little bit worried about, or you've never really understood since medical school? Think about those beforehand and make sure you target them in your rotation, and please, plan your annual and study leave. It's amazing how many times people miss out on these things because they don't plan them and they don't think about them before they do. It's a little bit too late. Max each job that you do. This is your training. The more you put into it, the more you're going to get out of it. Get the basics done first. Like, Don't be somebody who, in with five days to go of your rotation, you're still trying to struggle to get your mandatory assessments done. Get the basics done. Get them out the way. Make a list. Write down the things that have to be done. And within two months, aim for within two months or halfway through your rotation, three months if you're doing a six-month rotation, get the basics done. Get the bare minimum done so the rest of it you're not stressing. Get them done early. Don't leave them to the end. You're not just serving prison. Like we said, you've got your own training needs. You have to think about those as well. Always look to create opportunities and keep telling yourself, even on those difficult on-call days, that look, I'm never going to be able to do this again. I'm never going to be able to get and see this many ONG cases on call in my life again. So I need to make the most of it now. I know it's difficult, but it keeps going back to that thing we talked about at the beginning. The choices you're going to have in a few years' time are because you're working here right now. So make sure you maximize each job that you do. A quick word about your PDP then. This is something that you're going to have to do throughout GP training and beyond. It's not just something you're going to do for three years. It's something that you're going to do for the rest of your, your clinical career. Obviously, you've got to identify your plan, work out how you want to develop. It's not a, a set of things that you have to do because someone else has told you to do them. There's many of those already. You've got to plan your own things. What are your own learning needs? And if you're not careful and if you don't plan it, then you're going to be given things to do and you're not going to want to do them. So you've got to be smart about this. Try and figure out a balance between what are the kind of things that you're going to do anyway and versus what are the things that you do in addition to that. So you don't want to do all your PDPs thinking about all these things that are going to be very difficult to achieve. Think about a few that are going to get done anyway just by the nature of the job and then add a few that you think personally for you might be useful. We have a blog. A lot of you guys have already seen this, I'm sure. We have a blog. We have about 22 different GP rotations, and we've got sample PDPs to the kind of things to think about. For example, elderly care. For example, psychiatry. 10 things that you really want to get done before the end of that rotation. Not only does it get you thinking about how you can start doing these things early, but also it helps you write PDPs if you're struggling. So if you go to our website, auroramedicaleducation.co.uk, go to the blog section and look at this one, PDPs for GP training rotations, and you'll find a whole bunch of them for you to get ready for your exams, not for your exams, for your rotation. Right, the fourth thing then out of 10, I remember being completely overwhelmed by the portfolio. So for those people at the beginning who said, I'm really stressed about portfolio, um, what is SEPs? I'll come on to SEPs uh, in, in a minute. Um, just don't worry about it, firstly. I remember being super, super overwhelmed, and you've got a new portfolio anyway, which is a new version that's going to be launching in August 20. There have been some trials of them already in some of the areas, but there's going to be a brand new version of August 2020. So everybody's going to be learning together. So don't worry. It's going to be ST2s and ST3s who are struggling with the OE portfolio as well this time around. So please don't worry. What is your portfolio? It's your evidence from training from start to finish. Whatever happens in training, if it's not in your portfolio, it won't be remembered. Have, everything has to go in your portfolio. You put things in your portfolio, your trainers put things in your portfolio, and other educators put things in your portfolio. But it's your journey from the start to finish. 
It documents progress, it documents learning, and it documents that curve as you start from ST1 right till your final day as a trainee. All your assessments, like your assessments are recorded here, and it's basically what's used for your ARCP. So at the end of every year, when, when a panel sits there and looks to see, can this person progress from ST1 to ST2, 99% is going to come from your portfolio. So you've got to make sure your portfolio works for you rather than works against you. When you get to your exams, all your results come through your portfolio, so it can be quite scary. I remember trying to sit in there opening up my AKT result again and again every 10 minutes until you get that tick. It's very scary, but your exam results come through your portfolio. And like I said, it's accessible to you, your supervisor, and also some DNU administrators as well. And there's a really good help desk number and email address, so please do use it if you're struggling. You won't be the only one. And remember, no question is too much to ask, but ePortfolio is very, very important. Now, you will be filling in a lot of different learning log types when you go through your ST1 to ST3 years. Some of them are going to be more for ST3, but there are going to be some that you're going to be writing lots of. So we cover all of these in the online course in much, much more detail, but you have to do a placement planning meeting. So that's something that you want to get done in the first couple of weeks. It's now mandatory to do a placement planning meeting for every rotation that you do in GP training. So the quicker you can do this, the better, but it has to be then entered as a learning log. Clinical case reviews, these are gonna be the, probably the commonest ones that you do. You have to do a minimum of 36 of these in a year, minimum 36 clinical case reviews in a year, which means a minimum of three per month, set little targets, three per month, so if you can set maybe one a week, then you're well in the clear. So have little targets like this. We'll talk about these in much more detail, like I said, in the course. CBDs so are any kind of courses you go to, any e-learning that you do, any modules that you do will go under the bracket of supporting documentation or CPD. There are things called learning or significant event analysis. You'll know about SEAs, I'm sure. Learning event analysis are things that are not quite significant event analysis, but it's where something could have gone wrong and you can learn from it. So you can now enter these as LEAs, there's something called a feedback learning log. So when you do things like a patient survey questionnaire or a multi-source feedback, then you get feedback on that and you can write a learning log about the feedback that you got. So say, for example, you have an ARCP, you'll get some feedback. You can then do an entry about how you reflect on that feedback. There's a leadership entry. If you do any kind of leadership activity, like you chair a meeting or you attend a leadership course, you'd put it under a leadership learning log. SEP, someone asked about, is all about examination. So there are five mandatory examinations that you have to have proved competence by by the end of ST3. So if you can start to get some of these SEPs done in ST1, then you're going to get well ahead of the game. And you can also do SEPs for other things as well. But there are five mandatory examinations that you need to get signed up for. And then the other ones really relate to especially things like ST3 or academic trainees. But the ones that you're going to be doing most of are your clinical case reviews, your CPD and supporting documentation, and then a few of the other ones as well, and one placement planning meeting. But it's important that you're gonna to have to just get used to these in the first few weeks. You're not gonna understand these at the beginning, but you need to just start putting them in, trialing them, and basically figuring them out like everybody else. So one thing that's really important in learning logs is that there's not the emphasis is not on you just writing what happened, descriptive analysis. It's about reflecting on the event. Reflection is something that, that actually we do all the time, but we find quite difficult to put into writing. But you've got to get used to this. Reflection is going to be a strong part of you as a GP20. And if you can get this bit sorted out early on in ST1 by writing lots of um, learning logs, getting some feedback on it, and just figuring out, look, what is reflection? It's going to save you a lot of hassle going on. Because if you don't get it right early on, then... You're going to start getting comments in your portfolio, needs to get more reflective, needs to be a little bit more reflective. And then you start stressing, what does reflective mean? And you start overthinking it and just writing more and more and more. And you've always got to think two things in mind. Number one, simple is key. Simple is more important than complex. People just go into too much complexity. And number two, always think that there's somebody else reading this. If I would find it hard to read this, then the person is going to actually find it hard as well. So you've got to keep it as simple as possible. And we have blogs and videos on how to do reflection. So please find them out if you struggle. But you need to get used to this. And then you link your learning logs. As you enter these learning logs, you link them to either clinical experience groups or capabilities. Now, these are in the new GP curriculum. So before you start training, have a look at the GP curriculum. There are, I think, nine clinical experience groups pediatrics, elderly care, um, respiratory, et cetera, chronic disease. And then there are 13 capabilities. These are more kind of um, things that you would, attributes that you need to have as a GP. So you can link your learning logs. If you think that they, they link to particular clinical experience groups, say, example, you saw a patient with AF, 
then you might link it to say cardiovascular, for example. But if you thought that that also demonstrates your ability to take a good history, but also shows good communication skills, you might be able to link it to those two capabilities, for example. So you've got to get used to smart use of the portfolio because by the end, you need to have demonstrated that you've got good coverage across all the clinical experience groups and all the capabilities. And your learning logs are the way that you start to demonstrate those yourself. You can link up to two, um, to each learning log, so two clinical capabilities or two, so two experience groups or two capabilities, so make use of them. But remember, your educational supervisor can edit them. So if they think that this doesn't link with this CEG or it doesn't link with that capability, they can take it off as well. Remember, your clinical, your educational supervisor, stroke clinical supervisor will be going through your learning logs as well and writing comments and linking as necessary. Do we have examples of these things? No, but on the online course we do, but because this is a quick whistle-stop tour, we don't have them any here tonight. But you've got a max your portfolio. Don't, don't think, oh, it's just something I've got to be doing and I can't be bothered and I hate it. And Because if you start with that attitude, it's never going to get any better. Embrace it. Document everything firstly. If it's come to your mind, should I put it in my portfolio, put it in. Don't think twice. Don't spend half an hour thinking, should I put it in my portfolio or not? Spend five minutes putting it in. Document everything. Because remember, the ARCP, if it's not written down, is probably not going to be thought of as there. Know what's required of you. Know how many entries you've got to get in so you're ahead. And know which assessments you've got to do. We'll talk about these later on. Set targets. Don't just think, oh, okay, by the end of three months, I need to put this many in. Set targets, week, month, days even. Just put little targets because little targets, if you just stick to them, the bigger picture happens. If you just start thinking, I need to do 36 by the end of the year, it'll be half through the year and you've done 10. Like to have little targets and make sure you stick to them. And like we said, it's reflection, not recording. It's about showing what you've learned from it, what you've taken out from it, what have you, how are you going to change management going forward? That's much more important to somebody who's reading than just simply what happened. I saw a 36-year-old lady with AF. They had a heart rate of 122. They had a blood pressure of 30. And it just goes on and on and on and on and on. Make sure it's all about reflection, not about recording. Number five, I had no idea how important planning would be. I just thought, look, I start GP training. I'll be told what to do. I just need to jump through the hoop. I just need to be, be a good trainee and I'll reach the end. You can't. Now you're starting to go into that zone where responsibility for your own training has to become apparent. And I didn't really realize that. When I started training, like I said, I jumped into A&E and I kind of just expected everything to be told to me when I have to do an ESR, when I have to do a CSR, when I have to do another learning log. And you quickly realize that, okay, there's nobody here who's going to push me. I need to push myself. Remember, your educational supervisors are jobbing busy GPs with multiple roles. They can't be watching and telling you what to do all the time, and nor can your PD. So I had to quickly learn how to plan. So you've got to start this. And the earlier you do it, the better, because not just for GP training, this is going to set you up for a career in G general practice as well. General practice is, is crazy, but if you haven't planned it, it's even crazier. So plan your week, plan your month, plan your rotation, plan your year, just plan everything ahead. Plan your assessments. How many do you have to do in this month? Write down when you're going to do them. Exams and revision. Don't just leave it till you know three months for the exam and then come to someone like me and say, what do I do? I've got my exam in three months. Start planning in advance. ST1 is really important to plan exams. We'll talk about that in a second. Plan your leave. Don't you know you need your you time. If you don't plan this, you're going to miss out on it. Plan your key days. When are ARCPs? When are my ESRs? Get them in a diary. Get them on a calendar so you can see schematically where you're going to be in the next three to four months. Not just plan it, because everyone can plan, right? You could just say, I want to do this, 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 this. That doesn't really mean anything until you tell somebody. Tell somebody your plan. This could be somebody at home. I don't know. It could just be your spouse. This is what I'm going to do, so make sure I do this in, in three months. But more importantly, tell someone at work. See, what I used to do, and I learned this very quickly, by the time I got to my second rotation in GP training, I realized that I'd wasted a whole first rotation, basically. I hadn't really done my assessments. I'd just basically scraped by with a minimum. So what I did is I wrote down my plan and I sent it to my ES. I wrote down that just so you know, this is what I'm planning to do. And I gave it a week by week plan, this many learning logs, this, this many assessments. This is when I want to do my CSR. This is when I want to, and I gave it to my ES. Now I knew that I had to stick to that plan now because I had accountability. It wasn't just that I hoped and dreamed that I'd do this. It sounded nice on paper, but unless I made somebody, I was accountable to somebody, it didn't get done. So that from then on, my rotations went as smooth as anything because I knew that if I don't do this, I'm gonna to have to explain to my ES why this, they're not even bothered why I why I didn't do it, but I knew I'd have to explain to them. And that got me doing things, that got me booking things and got me ahead. So tell someone your plan, write a plan, yes. Most people don't even do this, but very few will tell somebody it. That makes it even stronger 
and trying to get into a habit that gets you doing things. Three must do. This is what I do. Three must do's a day. The night before I go to bed, I think, right, what are the three must do's tomorrow? And I know from the night before that I'm planning that for the next day. So it's really amazing that those three must do's a day, they're usually done by about 11, 12 o'clock. But if I hadn't thought three must do's, I just thought, okay, I need to at some point do this, some point do this, some point do this. Your brain just gets mixed with so many things and you never get them done. Three must do's a day, keep it simple, get them done. And imagine three must do's a day are 21 must do's a week, which is what? 90 or 100 must do's in a month, which is nearly a thousand must do's in a year. Now, if that doesn't put you ahead as a GP trainee, nothing else will. Number six, I had no idea how many difficult days there would be. Honestly, I had no idea how many difficult days. This could be due to work stuff, on call stuff, things going on in rotations, things going on trying to balance life up. Just I had no idea how many difficult days there would be. And no one really talks about this. People always talk about, you know, just get through your exams and be good and get your assessments done, and do your portfolio, and you'll be fine. You'll be a GP. Life happens, right? Stuff happens and you have to be prepared for the bad days because you're going to have bad days. You're going to have days where you come home and think, oh, why am I doing this? Like, do I really want to be a GP? Do I really want to be a doctor? Like, why did I do this? Why, why did I do something else? Get prepared for it. Stress and burnout is a real thing. I have contact with GP20s every single day of the year. And I always, always, every couple of days get messages from somebody who's saying that they're really struggling. Somebody. It's just, it's just very normal for me to hear these now because I see it so often. And if you don't prepare for it and expect it, it's going to hit you at some point. Three years is a very, very long time. You're going to be overwhelmed at times by the curriculum, by the exams, by the number of out of hours that you have to do, the on calls, life events. These are going to happen. A few things you can do to get ready. Know your go-tos. Okay, You need to have people who are in place that you know you're going to go to when things get difficult. Often what happens is people things get difficult. And then in the middle of that stressful situation, people start thinking, okay, who, who, who should I go to? Who can I turn to? You haven't planned anything. So it's very hard to turn to somebody when you're actually struggling. It adds another week, another two weeks. Know your go-tos. Plan. When I get stressed, when I find things difficult, this is who I'm going to go to. It could be your ES. It could be your TPD. It could be someone you get on with. It could be something out of your career, out of your training. But have a go-to in place. Don't try and work that out in the middle of when you're going through stress. Go early. When you know your go-to, that's one thing. But go early. When the first signs are there that this is getting difficult, go then. Don't go. Don't think, I'll give it a week, give it two weeks, give it three weeks. Because then you're letting things build up and it makes it harder to deal with. Go early. Have a plan in place. This could include having your go-tos and go early. And plan you time. Every week, every month, whatever it is, just give yourself some time for yourself. Plug it in. Plug it in. You know, if you're writing your plan out, of your uh, your three months four months if you're writing your plan put in some your some you time complete weekend off you know one day a week completely off just put some time in the diary because if you keep thinking oh i'll i'll take a bit of time for me take a bit of time for me it never happens and then you start getting overwhelmed and everything takes over and then you feel like i don't have time to have me time now and then it starts getting worse and worse and worse so plan some you time know your go-tos go early but expect that at some point in gp training you are going to be super 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 stressed and how can you try and help against this one good thing that we did when I was a GP20 is we set up a core group. So very early on in ST1, I think it was about two, three weeks into ST1, there was about four or five of us who got together and we pretty much stuck it out as a core group till the end. We were like, right, because we'd heard this from other people. Other people had told us, get a core group because you're going to get stressed. So we did this and, and we thought, okay, so ST1, the four or five people that I was in a core group with were, were the sounding board. Initially, it was all about, well, what do you do with this? Like, what's this assessment all about? And who can fill out this kind of form? And when, what day is this deadline by? And basically it was about just getting through ST1 together. So we all kind of muddled our way through it and figured out what's going on. By ST2, this group became my core AKT group. I started doing sessions with them, teaching with them, learning with them, splitting groups up between topics between us, getting together once a week. That became my core group for ST2. And in ST3, the same core group became my CSA core group. We would go around to each other's house, practice role plays, and it was the same people that I got together with in ST1. Because if you don't do an ST1, then by the time it gets to ST3, I hear this all the time. 20 saying, there's no one in my VTS that I can practice with. Everyone is in groups and no one can practice with me. No one wants to do role plays with me. Why? Because you've just suddenly thought and hoped that if I, I could ignore everybody, and then I just come in ST3 and say, can I join your group? It doesn't happen. Get a core group early. It'll follow you through and beyond. I'm still in touch with my core group. Even when you, especially when you're first few days of GP, you think the first few days of GP training is tough? The first few days of being a GP is 
crazy tough. So you need people to, to bounce off. And if you haven't got a core group, it's going to be very hard to find one. So I really recommend in the first couple of weeks, get a few together who just become your, your group that you go to for every query that you have. And it's going to get you through the rocky times. How big is my core group? At the moment, it's probably about four. It started off at about six or seven. Um, and that was perfectly enough in terms of numbers. Right, we have a quick break now, but is this helping so far? Is it useful? Give me some feedback. Let me know if I can improve it. Is it worth it? Is it giving you some good ideas? Is it telling you things that you already know? Or is it kind of good, 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 good. Lots and lots of positive comments. I'm really glad. This is the kind of stuff that no one told me. No one told me this kind of stuff. Everyone's like, just turn up on this day. This is your induction. This is your time. Bring this and that's it. And I just got to learn this all the hard way. So I'm really, really happy. Don't be stressed. Oh, good. Less stress. Good. Phew. I thought Irene said really stressed. Less stressed. Good, 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 good. Okay. Right. As promised, we're going to have a quick break, but let me give you these codes. So the GPSD1 Training Max course is a half day course. The code for 20% off is GPST Save 20. Now you can have one month, three months, six months, or 12 months. It's a full online course. You get a full PDF document that goes with it. And this is everything that we cover. So you can see all the kind of things that we're going to detail about. So you basically sign up and you get access for this amount of time. And with 20% off, if for a month, it's only 63 pounds, it's normally 80. And at 12 months, it's 111, it's normally 139. So this is the code, GPST save 20. I'm just gonna quickly show you how to find that on the website. So you go to the website and you go to online courses and you drop down and you find here, GP Trainee Max online course. And then you, there's a sample if you wanna watch it. Um, and then you just find your way down here. So that's the code for that one. GPST save 20. The next thing that we have, I promised you, is the 15% off our GPST one presentations audiobook course. So basically, we've covered these 50 presentations that you're going to see in general practice. And we teach you them in terms of what you need to think about in terms of a GP, what questions to ask, how to approach things like ICE, what are the key red flags you need to know, what are the guidelines that you need to know. And it's basically getting you into the role for GP training. So it's really important for you to, to listen to some of this before you go into your GP rotation. But at the moment, it's 15% off for 10 people if you use this code, GPST Audio 15. These are no expiry. These, once you buy an audio book, it's yours for life. You get all updates for free. You can listen to it offline when you're traveling, commuting. They're designed to kind of make your time work better for you. So where do you find this on the website? Uh, if you go to audiobooks here and you scroll all the way down to this one, 50 GP presentations for GPSD1, GPSD2, and you plug it in and you get the code to take it down by 15%. And the third thing I promise I'll give you is the flashcards. So these are 150 cards that are used for things like AKT, but also just for daily day-to-day -day guideline updates. You can see some examples of them here. 10% discount on these. These are posted to your house. Um, card save 10. C-A-R-D-S-A-V-E 10 for the first 10 uses of that code only. This is what's covered. These are the 150 cards that we cover. There are other cards on the market, but we made sure we covered as much as we could in terms of current guidelines. Card save 10 is going to get you that discount. So I want to leave this here for two minutes, get a drink, have a bit of a stretch, and we'll come back and we'll rejoin the webinar in a few minutes time. Hey okay, guys, welcome back. I'm so sorry. Someone just mentioned that the codes have run out for the flashcards. They have. We've already had 10 purchases. So I'm really sorry if you're trying to use the code for the flashcards. Um, Zach, can we add another, another 10? Okay. So, yeah, so we just added another 10 of the flashcards because those codes went. So I'm really sorry. I didn't realize it was going to be that quick. So we just add another 10. So the flashcards, we have 10 left. We have one, two, three, four, five. Four of the online course codes left, and one, two, three, three of the audiobook courses left. So they're running out. So if you want to get them, please do try and get on the website and use them. But we've added another 10 for the flashcards because they went so fast and people were struggling. So I'm going to leave those on so you can carry on with those, but we're going to get more into it. Now, there's a couple of people before we move on who are still applying for GP training. Some of you say that you're looking to start in February, looking to start in August, et cetera. There's a couple of things that you might find useful. We have a couple of blogs about how to get into GP training. So one is a generic thing, how to get into to GP training as a whole. It covers all the stages. We have one that's specific to MSRA, 
and we have one that's specific GP stage three. At the moment, GP stage three is not happening. It's all about MSRA, but in the future, GP stage three will probably come back. So there's some blogs that you can just go to the website, go to the blog section and find these. And for MSRA, there are a few things that we know are gonna help you. So we have two audiobooks for MSRA, one for the clinical side of it, the clinical crammer, and the other is the SJT principles audiobook where we teach you all about SJTs and professional dilemmas. So these are non-expiries. So if you get them, then, the, then they're yours. You can listen to them as many times as you like. So it's worth listening to samples on the website for these. And what's coming next week are our SJT mock exams. Because a lot of people are saying to me, can you not do questions for SJTs? You find them really difficult. So we have some mock exams that are releasing next week just for the SJT part of MSRA because people really, really struggle with these and that should be coming in a week or two. But the, the audiobooks are already available if you're starting to prepare for GP entry. Right, so let's move on. Number seven, I remember being overwhelmed by assessments. Now, as I said to you, when I started my GP training, I went to A&E and I was just thrown anyway by A&E and all of its, its new differences to what I've been doing before. So I had to learn about the A&E stuff. So I didn't really think about assessments for probably the first month and a half. And that was my own fault, part, partly because I didn't want to think about, maybe I was just subconsciously not thinking about anything else apart from just trying to get through the job. But then suddenly I started getting emails saying, why have you not done any assessment? You need to get some assessments done. This is my ES. So at the time it was quite annoying, but I really realized that they were looking out for me and I didn't have to have an ES who told me this, but they did and it really helped me get back on track. And I was overwhelmed. I suddenly started looking at this list and thinking, oh my gosh, I need to do all of these by my ESR. And I was super stressed. So I encourage you, to try and get used to assessments early on so that you can start to get some out of the way. Now, assessments are basically all about W, you know, we talked about MRCGP having three components, AKT, CSA, and WBPA. WBPA is work-based place assessment, work-based place assessments. And the assessments are part of this. One third of MRCGP, like we said, some trainees, like I said, have passed the exams, but didn't complete training because of WBPA. So they hadn't got their assessments done properly throughout their rotations. So this is designed to assess your performance over time. So your, your AKT and CSA assess you there and then, but they can't really test everything. So some things are tested more on a longitudinal basis. So therefore you have to do assessments throughout training. So they focus on areas that you can't really test in AKT and CSA. So there's a number of different assessments and reports that have to be done. And these are mapped against the 13 RCGB capabilities. So you need to, whenever you're, you're never doing an assessment, we'll talk about them in a second, then they're mapped against those 13 things that we talked about when we talked about learning blocks. So these are the assessments and the acronyms that you're gonna get used to over the next two to three years. Please don't worry about them right now. Just try and let them soak over you so that you're not hearing them for the very first time in two weeks time. CBD, case-based discussion. You've probably done some of these already in your other, if you've been in F2, for example, you've probably done CBDs. This is where you've seen a patient in the past and you then let your trainer or your CS or your ES know that this is the patient I want to do a CBD on or they choose a patient that you've done in the past and you do a retrospective discussion, breakdown, evaluation about that particular case that you saw in the past. So that's a CBD. COTS and mini CEX are watching you actually do a consultation. So COTS are the ones that you do in GP land and mini CEXs are the ones that you do in hospital land. So they're both so so they're both similar, but there are different things that are asked of you because it's a hospital job versus a GP job. But essentially, these two are ones that you're watched doing a consultation or part of a consultation, and you're then assessed on that thing that they watch, as opposed to a CBD or a CAT, which is what you do when you're in GP land, looking backwards retrospectively at an event that's already happened. MSF, multi-source feedback, you have to do this in SD1. You have to get your colleagues to give you feedback on how you are clinically and also professionally as well. Um, these are all covered in more detail in the online course, by the way, so I haven't got time to go through them all now. You have to do some kind of quality improvement exercise when you're doing your GP job in SD1 or SD2. So if you haven't got a GP job in SD1, you don't need to worry about QIP um, in terms of the assessment side of things. PSQ, then you've got some of these things that are only ST3, so I wouldn't really worry about them, but just so you've heard of PSQ, Audio Cot, CAT, Leadership MSS, Prescribing Assessment, these are all coming later, so I wouldn't really worry about them too much. The ones I'd worry about are CBD, COTS or mini CEXs, MSF, and then your CSR and your ESR. So remember we said that at the end of every rotation, your clinical supervisor writes a report on you. So at the end of every four months or six months, whether it's pediatrics or trauma orthopedics or cardiology, you get a clinical supervisor's report. So they assess you 
over those pe- those four months or six months. At the end of every six months, you get an educational supervisor report. So your ES, the person that's remember watching over the whole of your GP training, does a report on you as well, regardless of whether you've actually been taught by them or seen by them. And they go that they base that on things like the clinical supervisor report from the last job that you've just done, as well as all the assessments that you've had and the reports that you've had coming through through your workplace based assessment. So your CSR and your ESR are very important. And your ESR is very strongly used when it comes to ARCP. So you want your ESR to be basically clear of everything so the ARCP is as clean as possible. If there are issues in ESR, then, then it needs to be looked at in much more detail. How do you get your ESR good? You need to make sure the rest of your assessments are on time, then the minimum that you need to do, and probably one extra as well, and that they're of a sound level. And if you haven't got one of a sound level, you do another one till you get it to a sound level. But this is something that you'll be told about a lot, I'm sure, at induction, but it's worth getting these in your mind now so it's not something that takes a few weeks to get used to when you first start training. What do you have to do in ST1 then? So in ST1, things have changed slightly now. Remember, from August 2020, the guidance is going to be changing because the portfolio is changing. So you have to do four mini CEXs or four COTS, depending on which jobs you're doing. Remember, mini CEXs, hospital COTS in GP land. So four in total of these, four CBDs or CATs if you're in GP land, but four of those in a year, one multi-source feedback in ST1, one learning event analysis. Remember we talked about SEA, significant event analysis in the past. They didn't have an LEA, but now they've brought in an LEA, which is a level less than an SEA. So everyone should have one of those at least. One quality improvement activity if you're in general practice. So if you're not doing GP as part of your ST1 rotations, you don't need to do your quip yet. You'll do it in ST2. One CSR, clinical supervisor report for every post that you do for every rotation, and one educational supervisor report minimum in your first year as an ST1. Now, obviously, if you're less than full time, then these are going to be staggered accordingly, pro rata, but these are the minimum that you need to be bearing in mind. Again, don't worry too much, but you can see, actually, you can get these done quite quickly. If you think about, say you say you aim to get two done in your first rotation, two in your second rotation, and maybe one in your third, you're already in the clear. So it's just about planning these things and getting far ahead rather than thinking, okay, I'm in my third rotation, and I've only got one mini CEX. I've got to do three more amongst having to do lots of other things and annual leave is already booked and it gets very difficult to think about these things. So just getting ahead um, is really, really key. Number eight, I had no idea how quickly exams would arrive. When I was ST1, did I think about exams? No. Did I switch off when people talked about exams? Yes. I was thinking, you know what, exams are so far away. I don't need to worry about exams. I'll just do them when I get around to them. And you know, that's me talking now. I'm I'm someone who now trains people to get through exams. So I'd never I'd never advise that to others, but that's what I was doing when I was in ST1. And suddenly hit ST2, and it was like, when are you gonna do your AKT? And I was like, well, AKT is now. And suddenly I realized, okay, I've got AKT. If I want to do it, I can do it in the next few months. But I couldn't because I hadn't prepared enough. And all my friends did it early on, and I was the one who hadn't done it, and it just stressed me out. So I had no idea how quickly they would arrive. So let's quickly overview the exams. There are two ones that you need to know about, AKT, Applied Knowledge Test, and CSA, Clinical Skills Assessment. Very passable exams, very, very passable exams, but like any exam, you have to treat it properly. You have to plan it well and plan it early, and we'll talk about some of the things that you can do right now. Remember, you're all preparing. You're not just starting to prepare for AKT in ST2. You're preparing for AKT from ST1 onwards, and we'll talk about how you can use your ST1 rotations to start your preparation anyhow without even almost realizing it. And then you've got to take advantage of passive learning. One of the things that I realized very quickly for AKT is I cannot sit there in two months and learn everything. You can cram stuff in, but it's not like exams you've done in the past, not like med school exams where you can sit there, do an all-nighter, and then win. You have to be taking advantage of passive learning, and that's why we do a lot of social media teaching, which I'll talk about in a second, that get things into your mind without you even realizing it, because otherwise it's going to be a lot of stress when it comes up. So let's focus on AKT first, because that's the one that's going to come to you. Well, think about this. If you're starting in two weeks' time, you'll be able to do AKT in 12 months. Like, it's coming fast. And the, the quickness that your some of your rotations go, like if you're doing, for example, A&E, pediatrics, acute medicine, that one year is going to fly by, and suddenly AKT is going to be around the corner. Applied is the key thing. It's not a KT. It's not a knowledge test. By now, they assume that you have the knowledge. By the time you do AKT, it's not like, do you know the four causes of heart failure or the 14 causes of heart failure? That's the bit that's, that's assumed. 
Now it's applied. So when you see a patient who comes in with a particular thing that might well be heart failure, but you're not sure which is the test that you might think about doing first on the base of gut decision. That's the application of knowledge. It's not the, these are the four tests that have to have a heart, for suspected heart failure. These are the four symptoms of heart failure. These are the four causes of heart failure. Now it's applying all that together, recreating a question, trying to create someone in front of you in GP land. What are you going to do? Often there are two potentially right answers, which is the most correct one. This is where AKT starts to throw people a little bit. It's applied knowledge, not knowledge. 200 questions, MCQ format, three hours and 10 minutes is about a 57 per second uh, 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 affair, but it obviously differs from one question to another. How does it break down? 80% of your questions are going to be clinical based. 10% are going to be stats. So things like graphs and calculations and odds ratios and screening tables and Kate's diagrams and funnel plots and forest plots and Bayesian probability stuff that, to be honest, when have you ever read this? And then thirdly is admin, the organizational and admin side of general practice, how it all works. How does funding work? What about the rules and regulations? What are, you know, what, what are the employment rules? What are the, the occupational rules? What are the GVLA rules? Like all this stuff is admin and organizations. So that's 10%. Different question types. Most are SBA, so single best answer, five options, choose the most appropriate one. Then you get EMQ, so 15 answers, choose two or three maybe, or the one that suits best. And there are other ones, like typing ones as well, but the majority are going to be SBA and EMQ. You can take it, like I said, from ST2 onwards, four attempts, but cover that up. I like, don't even read that now. Don't even think you've got four attempts. Think you've got one attempt. Just think I've got one attempt at AKT because you know what your brain will say if you just do a little bit of work and think, oh, well, if I'll give it a go and if I don't do it, I'll do it next time. You're not going to pass that time because you're not going to put the time in. You've only got one attempt, but in brackets, you've got four attempts. It costs though, about 450 pounds to take it. So you don't want to be on your fourth attempt. How can you do stuff in SD1 curriculum? Like everything's going to come, nothing's going to come in that exam that's not in the curriculum. So make sure from early on, you're starting to look at the curriculum. Don't learn it. Don't just don't, you'll get stressed if you try and learn it. Just read through it. Understand the kind of things that may come up. For example, in stats, if you just open up your stats online course, for example, two weeks before the exam, thinking I'll learn stats now, it'll stress you out. Make sure you've looked through the curriculum, understand what are the kind of things that they want me to know, even if you're not going to revise it at this point. CKS guidelines, super, super, super important. There are multiple, multiple, multiple numbers of guidelines in this country. Can you learn every single one? No. What is nice CKS? A summary for general practice based on all the main guidelines in the UK. So start reading nice CKS. All of our teaching is based on nice CKS guidelines, whether it's online, audio, flashcards, they're all based on nice CKS because that's general practice based summaries based on national guidance for lots of different things. For example, you know, asthma has got a bunch of different guidelines. Nice CKS is the summary of them all. Make sure you're doing free, make sure you're using this stuff. Like two things we do for free that we do that you should be using from day one of ST1, even though AKT is not for another 12 months. Number one, get our daily e email revision. We probably have about 4,000 people who get our email every day right now. At 8 p.m. every day, you get an email, really quick clinical question. You see a 36-year-old person coming in with this. Can you remember the top three causes of this? And there's a quick video, 60-second video to watch that night that summarizes that question and then you move away. Like it takes you a minute to read that email, but if you do that every single day, that's 365 little things that you've learned by the time you start to even think about revising for AKT. Go to the website, let me just quickly show you how you do this. You go to the website, you go up here, see join Aurora Daily, click on that link, and there's a form that comes up, you just need to put it in your email, first name, last name, click what, what layer you are, and then say, yes, I wanna sign up to the emails, click subscribe. You will then get an email, that you need to then reconfirm, yes, I do want to receive them. And then you'll start getting the emails um, literally from that night onwards. But get those daily emails. You can unsubscribe, by the way, if you don't like it, just subscribe, but at least start. And then social media. I don't know what how you guys found us who said social media, but we're, we're on Instagram, on Twitter, on YouTube, on Facebook, and I'll show you the links in a second. But use it. Like we post probably a hundred times a day across all of our streams, just free stuff. Just passive learning, like you're in the middle of doing something, you're reading something on Facebook, you just see something pop up, you see it, you learn it, it's gone. Like a lot of learning has to be passive these days because there's so much to do actively when you actually sit down and do it. And then read about what you see. One of the most powerful things you can do, if you've seen a case um, that day, just one case every day, one patient every day, just go and read a bit about it because um, it'll stick much better than when you come and try and learn that thing in another seven months time. Things you can do early on in STV1. We have loads of stuff at AKT, and these are some of the stuff that hopefully you'll be using later on 
but we try and teach according to everyone's preferred stand or style. So we have the flashcards that, that you could be using from now that will cover you even from now. We have online courses where you watch them and you can pause, rewind, rewatch. You have PDF packages that come with those. We have our audiobook courses, clinical stats, admin that you download to your phone and listen to. A lot of ST1s, by the way, get our audiobooks because there's no expiry. So if you're going to do anything for AKT right now, it's the audiobooks I would get simply because you can listen to them now and have them. Even if you do AKT in two years, they're still there. And if they're updated, you get them for free. So, and it's just a one off purchase. Whereas the online courses, there's a subscription one, three, six, 12 months. So they're better near the time. And then we have mock exams that you can do that we released about three weeks ago, like fully automated 200 question mock exams and time conditions. And then we have our big virtual mock course that you come and join us on on the day, but that's kind of closer to the exam. And then we have a gold package that kind of covers everything in a discounted bundle. But for now, ST1, the audiobooks would work and the flashcards would work. What's CSA? This is the one that people worry about, even though people fail AKT a lot more than, than people think, but people worry about the CSA. Clinical skills assessment, you go to the college to do this. This is an ST3. It's a full morning or a full afternoon where you do a 13 station OSCE, lasts about two and a half hours, the actual exam part. Every case has a maximum of nine marks and therefore we get a maximum of 117. Pass marks are about 70. Three areas that looked at data gathering, clinical management, interpersonal skills, and it's not just like, can you diagnose a migraine and treat a migraine? Again, they kind of expect that you can diagnose a migraine and treat a migraine by then. It's about, can you diagnose a migraine? Can you rule out all the key red flags? Can you deal with the fact that she's demanding a CT scan? Can you deal with the fact that she's getting angry? Can you deal with the worry about a tumor? Can you look at resources to see what investigations might be needed now? Can you explain how a psychosocial links like stress at work and drinking too much caffeine might be making this tension headache worse? And can you do all that in 10 minutes? That's really what the CSA is all about. So it's someone that needs a lot of practice. And, you know, later on down the years, when you come to CSA, we have lots and lots of things that we can help with CSA as well. You can do it pretty much once a month from October to May. And again, in brackets, max four attempts, but this costs 1600 ish, 13, 1600 ish. So you want to do that once. You've only got one attempt. Number nine, we're getting near the end now. Sorry, it's gone a little bit longer than I thought. So much information. I had no idea how important networking would be. Networking is huge. And again, if you're someone who kind of thinks, I'll just go to GP training, I'll get through my exams, and I'll kind of keep a, a low head, that's fine. You'll get to the end, you'll be a GP. And if that's you, that's you. But networking in this day and age is super, super important. And there's no, it's the easiest time to network, given that you can do it all online these days. But you've got to know people, not just to get you through GP training, but beyond GP training as well. Like when you come out the other end, you're going to be independent GP and you're going to be doing stuff like looking for jobs and even trying to figure out where the best place to work is. And you're going to, have to look for opportunities in terms of you know, other things that you might want to do in your career. And if you haven't been networking in GP trainee land, well, actually, you've got everything in front of you. Everything, every type of person that you need to meet is somewhere in GP training. Then you're going to miss out on an important thing. And I, and I learned this probably after about three to four months, once I got out of A&E and I got into my next rotation, then I started properly networking, which really helped for when I became a GP. So you've got to network with your peers, of course. So don't just stay on your own and just do your own thing and think that I can just get through this and that's it. Network with everybody because you never know how many good friendships you're going to make through GP training and when you can, um, like you said, your core group, how you can use each other to help you through various steps. WhatsApp groups, form them early on, of course, social media, make sure you're, you're networking through social media. So many GP related trainee groups on Facebook. We'll talk about ours in a second, but there's so many you can use. Why is it important to network with peers? It stays sane, it keeps you level minded, it gives you a safety blanket from, you know, if you really forget when to do an assessment, why other people will tell you, it gives you new ideas, sounding board like we talked about, and it helps with exam prep. Network with educators. Educators have everything that you need for when you come out of GP training and everything to get you through in the first place. So, so build up relationships with them. Make the extra mile. Take the initiative. Send them emails. Make sure you show that you're someone who wants to network. And, and it's amazing how many opportunities will come your way just by networking, just by talking to people. It's amazing how often that when you're looking for a job, someone will go, oh, by the way, did you hear about this job? They had a vacancy around the corner. Like that only happens because you've taken the, uh, taken the energy and taken the opportunity to network with people when you're a GP trainee. And of course, you learn about general practice just by Talking to educators, yes, you've got to get through your exams, but actually you're training to be an independent GP. So learning about what's happening, learning about the changes, learning about what commissioning is, learning about the future general practice, all this happens through networking. You can attend events, you can go to meetings like CCG meetings, your LMC meetings, your local RCGP meetings, just ask. They're always happy for trainees to come. They always love trainees coming because they value your input. There's so many organizations want to know what trainees think and what they're doing. 
No one really goes to these things. So you could easily um, use these to advantage. And of course, you can do this at courses as well. But network, network, network. I didn't do it enough. I wish I did it more. Right. So we talked about um, our teaching on social media. These are the links. So if you've got your phone right now, pick it up and grab some of these things. Now, the daily email, hopefully you can join up at any time. That's fine. Facebook, two main areas for Facebook. We have our main national GP training support group. This is the largest GP training support group in the whole country. There are about 20,000 people in this group. Just search Aurora GP training support. We do daily teaching. Lots of questions come up from your colleagues about what to do here, what form to have to do, and hopefully it's helping a lot of people already. And also we have our page, Dr. Omanura page, where we teach slightly differently and we put out more posts about general practice just to keep you up to date. But these two things on Facebook are important. Have a look at it, open your phone, have a look at it right now. If you're on Instagram and you learn by image, have a look at our Instagram page. We teach by image. Some people learn by flashy colors, pinks, yellows, oranges, just to get things short, sharp things as you're streaming through Instagram, things stick in your mind. Have a look at Insta right now, Dr. Um, at Dr. Underscore Amen Underscore Aurora. YouTube, we probably have about 400 videos on YouTube that we teach guidelines, all those kind of things. Again, short and sharp to keep it easy. And then we also uh, teach on Twitter as well. So if you're on any of these streams, if you have any feedback of tonight, by the way, please do post on these kind of groups. It's great to hear your feedback. Um, but even if you don't, please join them. If you don't like them, get rid of them, but try them out. And hopefully we can help teach you along the way and start to get you ready for exams. Number 10. I stressed about ARCP too much. I didn't have to stress too much, but I didn't realize that I would A, stress why it would worry me so much, and B, didn't realize that if I just planned it a little bit, I didn't have to worry half as much as I did. What is ARCP? Like I said, done every 12 months, you get an annual review of everything in your training once every 12 months. Basically, there's a panel of educators who sit down and they look through your portfolio and they look at all the assessments, they look at all the learning logs, they look at all the feedback, and they basically assess your fitness to move into the next year of training. And if it's your ST3, your ability to end training. You are given various outcomes. I would not worry about all of these outcomes because all you're gonna get is outcome one, which is satisfactory progress because you're gonna have planned things well and done everything on time. But you could get unsatisfactory outcomes, some of which will suggest you need more time so you can't finish ST1, you need to do another three months of ST1, for example, you don't want that, or, the one that everyone fears, which is not going to happen at this point, outcome four, release from training, that can happen at some points, and I've seen it happen, so it's important to be aware of it. Sometimes outcome five means you haven't got enough evidence, and so maybe there's an ESR missing. They just can't do the ARCP, so they just delay it for a couple of weeks sometimes. Outcome six is the one that you're all aiming for, the recommendation for CCT. This is the outcome that you get right at the end, and then there are a couple of other ones depending on things like career breaks, maternity, et cetera. So, but the ones to stand out, number one, you're looking for outcome one, outcome one again, and then outcome six. That's all you want, outcome one, outcome one, outcome six. ST1, ST2, ST3. But you, it's worth knowing that this is the kind of stuff that I'm gonna be looked at at the end of your year. Most have no problem, most fly through. I've sat on ARCP panels myself, most are fine, there's no issues. But sometimes you're called to panel, you're called up and you, you go there to talk about certain things, but sometimes decisions are made even without you being there. So it, it differs from one area to another, but um, it's important to be aware of ASAP and not worry about it. How do you not worry about it? Don't fear it, number one. It's not something to be scared about. It's something that is just part and process. Just remember, people fear it, but you can't become a GP without ARCP. So you have to just, you have to want it to happen so that you can clear a year. Like you're not gonna be able to clear the year if you can't do it. So don't fear it. Know what's needed each year. Like we talked about what's needed in ST1. If you stick to that and you know what you need to do and you get them all done well in advance, ARCP is gonna be fine. You just need to know what's needed. Don't get to eight months into ST1 and realize I've got a whole load of stuff I haven't done on my portfolio and a whole load of assessments I haven't done. That's when it's gonna stress you out. And do your own pre-ARCP beforehand. About 10 months into your year, nine months into your year, sit down, look at your portfolio, go through everything and tick everything off. Have you got this? Have you got this? If I was assessing this now, have I, have I got the ability to send this person straight through to ST2 or am I gonna have a doubt? And if there are doubts, you've still got two or three months to sort it out. Do your own pre ARC beforehand. Don't be the person that lets them have their first one. Make sure you've done your own. So one to 10 then. Hopefully you picked up a few things. What are the 10 things that I found really important for my GP training? Number one, I remember feeling so lost, so lost in the first few weeks. You will as well, please don't worry. Number two, I remember not knowing who is who. ESCS, AD, TPDs. You're gonna get used to these people, but hopefully you've understood a few of them now. Number three, I forgot I was a GP trainee in my hospital rotation. You are a GP trainee 
first and foremost, this is your training. You need to develop as a GP. So make sure you don't forget that as well. Number four, I remember being overwhelmed by the e-portfolio. Don't be overwhelmed. Just be expecting to be a little bit overwhelmed, number one, but just take your time, try it out, write a few learning logs, you'll be fine. Number five, I had no idea how much planning was needed. This is a big one. If you take one thing away from today, get that planning stuff in your mind and become accountable to somebody. Tell your plan to your ES and think about your three must-dos of every day. It's amazing how much you achieve. Number six, I had no idea how difficult days they would be. Prepare for this. Have a go-to. Go early. Have some you time planned in somewhere, but expect difficult days. Number seven, I remember being overwhelmed by assessments. You don't need to be. You've got to plan them well. They're not there to trick you. If you know what to be, if you know what's being assessed, then you'll be fine. Number eight, I had no idea how quickly exams would come around. So please, even ST1, start preparing for AKT a little bit, a little bit subconsciously. Get some passive learning in. Get some audio, something. Number nine, I had no idea how important networking would be. This is thinking about how much you take out of GP training at the end. And number 10, ARCP. If all these things are done properly, ARCP does not have to be as worrying as I let it become when I was a GP trainee. Max, who GP trainee? This is a time you've got to enjoy. It's a good time you've got to embrace it and you've got to shape it. You've got to make it your own training. Plan, 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 number one. Think like a GP, number two. Think like a GP. This is really important. Push yourself that little bit more. Develop a support blanket. Have your go-to engage as much as you can, make initiative, take the first rotation, send emails, target exams in advance, max your rotation as much as you can, and always make the first move. Thank you so much, guys. I'm gonna stick around and answer the questions, because there's been a lot of questions flying out, but if you have to go, thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for your energy. Any further help advice from me, you know where I am, 24 seven, please do contact me. These are all the codes. I think there are, let me see how many are left. Oh, I'm getting a lot of messages saying the codes have gone again. Uh, we're going to add another, oh, it's the flashcards. We're going to add another 10 for the flashcards. So if you give it two minutes and restart it, Zach, we're going to add another 10, yeah, 10 more, please. 10 more. Um, there's one code left for the GPSD1 online course. I'm going to leave it at that. There's one left for the online course if you want to get that. And then oh, we ran out of the audio as well. But Zach, can we add another five? We'll add another 10 for the audio as well. So we'll add another 10. So we'll leave these on till midnight. If you haven't got around to get them now, don't worry. We're going to make sure you get them before the end of the night. Right. I'm going to go through and go through some of the questions. If you haven't asked your question, please put them there now. And I'll make sure I try and cover all the questions that were there. If you have to go, thank you so much.